It, it truly is a joy to be here. As Nathan said, I serve with Paul Martin, who, was, uh, who graduated from this very school many years ago, and he speaks about it often. He speaks about it fondly. And uh, so it's just a joy to be here, to see it, to experience it. And uh, it's a joy to serve with him and to benefit from all that he learned while he was here. I want to talk about the Word of God, of course, but I want to start. I want Jonathan Edwards to be the one to get us there. On July 8, 1741, Jonathan Edwards went into a small church in Enfield, Connecticut, and preached what has to be the most famous sermon on this side of the Sermon on the Mount. He went into this church where the people were known as being very hard hearted, very stubborn. He had a real care for them, he had a real concern for them. And so he, he really wanted to reach them with the word. And so he took as his text, Deuteronomy 32, 35, simply, in due time their foot will slip. And from that little text, he preached the sermon we know now as sinners in the hands of an angry God. I want to read you just a, a small excerpt of that. God holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire. He abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath toward you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. He is of purer eyes than to bear to have you in his sight. You are 10,000 times more abominable in his eyes than the most hateful, venomous serpent is in ours. You have offended him infinitely more than ever a stubborn rebel did his prince. And yet it is nothing but his hand that holds you from falling into the fire every moment. It is to be ascribed to nothing else that you did not go to hell the last night, that you are allowed to wake again in this world after you closed your eyes to sleep. And there is no other reason to be given why you have not dropped into hell since you arose this morning, but that God's hand has held you up. There's no other reason to be given why you have not gone to hell since you have sat here in the house of God, provoking his pure eyes by your sinful, wicked manner of attending his solemn worship. Yea, there is nothing else that is to be given as a reason why you do not this very moment drop down into hell. We preach this in a calm and a steady and impassioned voice, but there is no yelling There was no screaming. This wasn't what we think of when we think of fire and brimstone kind of preaching. He wasn't yelling. He simply preached the word of God. And the reaction of the crowd was unexpected. One man who was there said this. He said, there was a great moaning and crying out throughout the whole house. What shall I do to be saved? Oh, I am going to hell. What shall I do for Christ? And so on. So that the minister was obliged to desist and to ask them to allow him to finish. The shrieks and cries were piercing and amazing. Well, that sermon came during a time we know now as the Great Awakening, a time that God was moving very, very powerfully in certain parts of the world. And what may have seemed like chaos, if you were sitting there watching it, you would have thought this was chaos with people crying out, people falling on their faces. This was actually just God's well-orchestrated plan to save his people. And how did he do it? He did it through the most ordinary of means, the preaching of the word of God. This is how God has always worked. He works through his word. I want to turn this morning to Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3, which is the account of an ancient great awakening, one that happened many, many years ago. And much like other revivals since then, there's really no way to explain it. There's no way to explain it except that God chose at that time to bless the preaching of his word in a special way. And like other revivals before or since, it both challenges and it encourages us in that way. So let's read Jonah chapter 3 together. I'll be reading from the ESV. Jonah 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God, 
They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hand. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Why would I come here and preach that text out of all the texts in the Bible? Because I think there is just great encouragement here for the preacher, great encouragement here for the pastor. Being in this text has just done great things in my heart. I want us to learn from this text that God is sovereign in salvation, that God is sovereign in evangelism, and that he works through his word. We see here that Jonah holds up a model for us of how God works, how we are to preach the gospel. Yeah, that text was for ancient Israel. It happened at a specific time, a specific place, within a specific context, and yet it speaks to us, to North American Christians today, We need God's rebuke, perhaps. We certainly need God's encouragement at the power of God's word. So here's what I want us to see. Here's what it means to preach God's word. You simply go where God commands, you speak God's message, and then you watch God work. That's all Jonah did. Go where God commands, speak God's message, and then just sit back and watch God work. So there's the first part. Just Go where God commands. Let me give you just a quick recap of Jonah 1 and 2. I'm sure you're very familiar with the story. God had spoken to his prophet Jonah and called him to do a specific task. He was supposed to go east, to go to the city of Nineveh. Jonah opted not to do that. He went west. He went to a place called Joppa, got aboard a ship, and headed out across the sea. God intercepted this prophet God intercepted him by throwing this great storm upon him so that the ship was about to break up. The only way to save the ship, to save the people aboard, was to throw Jonah overboard to get rid of the cause of the storm. And so the sailors picked the man up and they threw him overboard. Immediately the seas went calm. Jonah was left floundering in the ocean until a giant fish came and swallowed him. And you know, Jonah chapter two, Jonah's in the belly of that fish and he prays this amazing prayer of repentance. He draws from all sorts of Psalms and he just pours out his heart to God and he concludes salvation is of the Lord. He comes out a new man. He's literally vomited back out onto the beach and here he is, a new man. He wasn't at Nineveh though. He wasn't all the way where he needed to go. He still had a choice to make and God did something remarkable He gave him a second chance. Verse 1 of chapter 3, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. Those are almost identical words to chapter 1. God calls Jonah a second time to the very same task. And you know, when God tells you, when he tells any one of us to do something, there's two ways the story can go. The next word might be, but followed by a tale of disobedience. God said to do this, but Jonah did something else. Or the next word could be, so. God told Jonah what to do, so Jonah obeyed, and he did it. In chapter one, we read that word, but, and we just knew things were gonna get messy. Chapter three, we read the word, so. And now we see Jonah being obedient to God. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Do you see God's grace here in giving this man a second chance? Aren't you glad that God gives second chances? How many people here pursued God at the very first opportunity? How many people here believed God the very first time they heard the gospel message? How many people turned from sin the very first time God identified that sin to you through his word? Did you turn away immediately or did God have to warn you again and again? Aren't you 
grateful that we serve a God of second chances. Praise God for second chances. Well, Jonah's given a second chance here to go to obey God. And God tells him to go to Nineveh. He calls it that great city, Nineveh. That's an interesting phrase. It means something like Nineveh, a city great to God. So in this context here, Nineveh isn't a a huge city. It's not a mighty city. It's not a city full of important people, full of palaces, full of kings or princes. Nineveh is important because God has deemed it important to his purposes. The city's importance because God says it is important to him. He has something to accomplish right there. So it wasn't the city itself. It wasn't the walls or the streets or the bricks or the houses, even the palaces. It was the people. Nineveh's significance was in the fact God deemed it important. God deemed those people important. I believe Toronto, Toronto, Canada is a city that is important to God. That's why I pastor there. That's why uh, my church is involved in planting other churches there. We believe God has his people there. I trust that each one of you will end up in a place, that God will draw you to a place that you deem important, where you believe that God has his people to gather in and through them, his purposes to accomplish. I love to travel. I get to travel a fair bit. And and it always surprises me how you can go to this city or that city. You can go in this continent or that continent. And people there are excited about what God is doing there. They feel all the passion toward that city that I feel toward Toronto. God burdens us for people in a specific place. Well, Jonah went into this city. He went into Nineveh. It says it was an exceedingly great city, three days journey in breadth. We don't know exactly what it means that it was three days journey in breath, but whatever it means, it indicates this was a city that would take several days for a man to experience, even more, several days for a man to influence a city like that. It wasn't the kind of place he could just stand in the town square and speak and everybody would be able to hear him. He would have to move across that city. You know, what we need to see from Jonah, obedience to God means going where God commands. To be obedient to God, you have to go where God commands you to go. So where has God called you? Where has he called me to go? Where is our Nineveh? We can't expect that God will speak to us out of the sky, that God will speak to us directly like he did to Jonah. We don't expect that God will speak to us in some voice and say, you need to share the gospel with the person next door. You need to share the gospel with your daughter, with your father, whatever it is. God has already done that. He's already told us that. Matthew 28 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Acts 1 says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The call for us isn't to go to a specific place. God won't reveal that specific place to us. He just calls us to go. Go beginning with those people closest to you and go out from there, family and extended family and neighbors and go out to all the worlds. Just last week, I was in Scotland, a place just just crying out for men to go there. I went to a little church on a Sunday evening, a church that used to be thriving, 200, 300 people there, a healthy church. They're down to six senior citizens there now. They've got a building. They've got a place. They're crying out, won't a man come and pastor us? We need someone to come here to plant himself in that community, to have a burden for this community, and just to preach the gospel here, to tell people about Jesus. That whole country is just crying out for people to go and preach the gospel there. We are to go everywhere. We are to preach the gospel to everyone because we just don't know who it is that God has set his love upon. But we do know that God chooses to use us, his people, to gather them in. So there's the first lesson we want to take from Jonah here. Go where God commands. Go to the world. Go to the cities. Go to the country. Just go where God commands us to go. And when you get there, When you get where God places you, then preach God's message. Jonah arrives in Nineveh. 
God had given Jonah this two-part command, go and preach. Go and when you get there, preach the words I give you. Jonah would have been a failed missionary. He would have been a failed prophet if he went, but he didn't preach. And you and I, we are failed missionaries if we go and we don't preach. God didn't say go and start a soup kitchen. He didn't say go and start a sports camp. He didn't say go and just live differently in that area. Wait for people to to come and ask you what makes you different. Those may all be good things to do. But the command there was go and preach. Go and speak the words I give you. So Jonah went, verse 4, Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. There is his message. There's a message God gave him to preach. Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Three things I want us to note from that message. It was simple, it was clear, and it was preached. Jonah's message was simple. He said only what God told him to say. Now, I assume that when it says, the commentators assume too, that when it says, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown, that's a summary of his message. That's not the complete content of it. It's unlikely that he just stood there and said that. I'm sure he would have used his own story, right? God had given him this amazing story that paralleled what was going to happen in Nineveh. Disobedience, punishment, all of that. So I'm sure he could have testified that, you know what? I was rebellious. God gave me an opportunity to repent. I repented. God relented. The heart of his message would have been simply, you are sinful. God is merciful. Repent and trust in him. This wasn't a complicated apologetic. He didn't answer their every objection. He didn't begin a dialogue and sit and just talk things over. He just simply used simple words to say what God had told him to say. His message was simple. It was also very, very clear. There was no doubting the heart of the message. There was no doubting what he had said or what he meant. There wasn't, it wasn't all buried in fancy speech or rhetoric. You know, his message sounds an awful like what Paul would say when he called for clarity of preaching in 2 Corinthians. He says, we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Earlier, he had told that very same church, I did not proclaim the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. It was very, very clear what Jonah preached. God sees your sin. God is going to judge you. So repent, please repent. And God will relent of the disaster that he brought upon you. The third thing, Jonah was to preach. He was to stand in the place of God and to speak God's words on behalf of God. And what is preaching if not that very thing? This is God's word. This is what it means. This is how it matters to you today. Here's what you need to do about it. Here's how God's telling you to respond to his word. Preaching is really nothing more than standing in God's place and speaking God's message on behalf of God. And so the message Jonah brought, it was clear, It was simple, and it came through the form of preaching. So there's our challenge today. First go, and when you get there, just just preach. Just preach that beautiful and powerful and simple and clear and earth-shaking and soul-saving gospel and trust in God. And again, the great joy of being in Scotland last week was to see in the, the equivalent of inner city ministry there, they do things a little differently, but what is making the difference in people's lives, people addicted to drugs, people who for generations have just existed on government handouts, what's making the difference? The word of God preached to them day after day, week after week, the word of God is going out and it is absolutely transforming people. I spoke to one man who is rejoicing that he is finally paying taxes. He's never had to pay taxes because he's never worked. And now he's scrubbing toilets at a seminary and praising God that he now gets a tax slip saying that some of his money is going to the government. What can do that? Only God can change a man. So he rejoices in paying taxes. And it came through the word of God preached to that man. The third thing to see, Jonah got to Nineveh. He preached that simple, clear message 
And then he got the great honor, the great privilege of watching God work. See how easy it is? You go, you preach, and you watch. We make it so much more complicated than it needs to be. And if it was human effort, then I understand it. It would be complicated, but we know that God works through his word preached. So our task is to go and to preach, and it's his task to move. It's his task to change people. We can't make anyone repent. Not really. You know this if you're a parent. You know this if you're a pastor. You know this if you've worked with people. We can, we can guilt people into changing their behavior, right? But only God can actually guide people into a changed heart. This is exactly what we see in Nineveh. Verse 5, the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and they put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. That was just the beginning. The word reached the kingdom of Nineveh. He arose from his throne. He removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. You see what God's word is doing here. Then he issued a decree, a law. Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered in sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way, and from the violence that is in his hand. Can you picture this scene as Jonah goes into this city? He goes one day's journey into this scene or into this city. He finds a place to stand where there's a crowd around him. He clears his throat and he just starts to speak. He just starts to preach. He tells them who God is. He tells them that God is watching them, that God sees them. He must tell about his own time in the belly of the fish and what God had revealed to him, how he had turned away. That crowd must be starting to grow by now. He repeats, God sees you. God is going to judge you. His word is sure. People begin to sob. People begin to tremble. Some fall to the ground. Some are crying out just like in Enfield, Connecticut all those years ago. What shall I do to be saved? They hurry home after hearing this message. They now know we need to appease this God. What can we do to appease this God? And the word even comes to the king and he is struck. He believes, he's afraid. And so he issues this proclamation and soon all the people, the animals, they're covered in sackcloth. They're they're crying out to God in prayer. They're turning away from those evil things to do and they were an evil, evil culture. This whole city is now in this posture of repentance. You've had this city-wide revival, all from one man preaching the word of God. And so verse 10, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Well, of course he didn't do it. That shouldn't be any surprise. That's exactly who God is, right? Jeremiah 18 says, if at any time, I declare concerning a nation or kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it. And if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do to it. So here is God's mercy extended to that entire city of Nineveh. God called Jonah to go. Jonah went. He preached The people responded to the preaching of the word in repentance, and then God extended his mercy to them. Isn't that what we want? I want to be able to speak to the people in Canada, the people in Toronto, to tell them of the love of God and to see them turn and repent. And that's exactly what we're seeing. People coming to our church hungry to hear from the word of God, and when they hear it, they turn. I'm sure that's what you want in this area. Sure, that's what you want for your ministry when the Lord hands it to you. That's what we want for Scotland being there last week. People to go to preach and to see God work. It's the only way God guarantees he will work is through the preaching of his word. I love this. I love this example here of what true heart change looks like in these people. We, of course, we're always drawn to what happens on the outside of the person. And we know that God is drawn to the inside of the person. You know, it's not what these people did that merited forgiveness. God didn't turn away his wrath because they put on sackcloth, because they declared a fast. 
those actions, those just displayed what was happening on the inside of those people. All that outward, that flowed out of the inward change that had happened to them. These people, of all people knew, they had no merit to bring God. They weren't going to try to please God. They weren't going to try to attempt to convince him of their own righteousness. They weren't going to do anything like that. They wouldn't say, God, please just, I won't do it again, I promise. They knew all they could do is just plead with God for mercy, to own their guilt, to admit their guilt, and to plead for mercy. They didn't decide to try harder, to clean themselves up. Instead, they turned inwardly And all those outward things were simply a display of the change that had already happened within. You know, that kind of outer change, that is absolutely repulsive when it comes before the inward change. But that kind of outward change is beautiful, honoring to God when it comes after that inward change. That is worship and that is humility. So what did these people do? They simply heard, they believed, they repented, and they worshipped. And that's the right order. They heard, then they believed, then they repented, then they worshipped. That's what we look for when we see people profess faith. When my children come and say, Daddy, I think I'm a Christian, that's what I'm looking for. They've heard, they believe, they've repented. Now are they worshippers? Have they turned into worshippers of God? That's what I love to see in the people of my church, even the children in my family. You know, God didn't owe these people in Nineveh an opportunity to repent. He didn't owe it to them. He just offered it to them in mercy. Psalm 86, verse 5, For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. That's the God we serve. God didn't call upon them to clean themselves up, but just to turn to him, and he would be the one who would clean them up. So there's this tale of Jonah. Jonah going into this city and seeing this miraculous conversion, this miraculous revival. You may have wished, like I have in the past, that the book of Jonah just ended there and didn't go to chapter 4 where everything goes kind of unexpectedly. But from this, from this revival there in Nineveh many years ago, let me just give you four encouragements. Four encouragements, especially for the preacher, for the pastor. The first one is simple. God's word works. A lot of people look at this story. You read the wrong commentaries. People are saying, obviously, this is just a metaphor. This couldn't really have happened. You couldn't have a whole city repenting before God, a whole city turning from following false gods to this true and living God. Who on earth would believe something like this? I know. I know who would believe something like this. It's people who know that God's word works and people who know how God's word works. That's who will believe a story like this. You understand the power of the word of God as it is preached. God says he will work through the word. So why would we doubt a story like this? When we go where God commands, when we speak God's words, we've done our duty. We know now that God will work because the word never returns void. It always does something. It may harden, it may soften, Either way, God's purposes will be advanced. Both of those, both of those serve God's purposes. God's word works. Second, God's word changes even the most unlikely people. You know, one of the big um, purposes of the book of Jonah when it was written for Israel in those days was to show them that they believed they were worthy of God's love and other people weren't. They believed there was something innate in them that made them worthy of God's love, that God loved them because of something they had to offer him. God needed to show them. He needed to remind them that they were special only because they were chosen by him. They hadn't done anything that merited his favor. And I think we can very easily believe the same thing about ourselves. Why is your conversion, why is your conversion any more likely than the conversion of a single person in the city of Nineveh? To doubt that this happened is to doubt that God saved you. So there's a call for us here, I think, not to share the gospel with, only with people who are very much like you very much like us, or people we think, well, they're almost there. They're almost there. I I could see him being a Christian. I was like that once too. 
God loves to work in very unexpected ways. And one great story we've had lately, it's been written up in Christianity Today and other places, is Rosaria Butterfield, who was an English lit professor, and a, uh, her specialty was queer theory at Syracuse University. She was a committed lesbian. She was a member of a Unitarian Universalist church. And she got it in her mind that she was going to write a book about the religious right. In order to do that, she thought it was only fair if she read the Bible first. And so she sat down and she read the Bible. And she read it again. And she read it again. And there was something about God's word that gripped her. In that time, she wrote a letter in a local paper. And a pastor at a Reformed Presbyterian church wrote to her about that, invited her into their home, into their life, into their church. And wouldn't you know it, she recently released a book you really ought to read called Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert. She's now the wife of a Reformed Presbyterian pastor. It's this miraculous story of what God has done in her life. Who would have expected that the, the uh, queer theory professor at Syracuse University would one day be a pastor's wife, be serving who would have guessed the thief on the cross would repent? Who would have guessed that Paul, he was on the road to Damascus. He was there to persecute the church. Who would have guessed that he would become a believer? Who would have thought that you, I mean, honestly, who would have thought that you would be the one that God would save? If you think you're a more likely convert than anyone else, you just don't understand your heart all that well. That's what I love about Theology, what I love about Reformed theology, that doctrine of total depravity, that just lays us all down on our faces equally before the cross. That doctrine is the great equalizer of all of us. So there's a call to humility here because really you are Nineveh. You are the unlikely convert. You need to look inside yourself and say, of all the unlikely conversions I've ever seen, I'm the most unlikely of all. Third encouragement from this text, God protects his people. Remember here, the Ninevites were Israel's enemies. They were threatening the nation of Israel. They were always on the edge of war with Israel. You know, sometimes God protected his people by destroying their enemies. In this case, God protected his people by transforming the enemies. Jesus said, pray for your enemies. It's exactly what God does sometimes. Sometimes he deals with them one way. Sometimes he deals with them another way. But God protects his people. God protects the gospel. Fourth, final thing, final encouragement, keep sharing the gospel. Just keep doing it. Church history is absolutely full of this, full of unlikely conversions, full of God working powerfully, working way, way beyond what we would expect. And I wonder sometimes if, we, especially here in North America, just have stopped praying big. We're not praying big enough. Maybe we need to be praying for something like this to happen. Could we have the faith? I don't know that we have it now. Could we believe that something like this could actually happen? Why not? Why couldn't this happen today? There's a common thread in true revivals that it comes when God determines it will come, and it comes when Christians are simply being faithful, right? Usually the circumstances don't change. God just at some time determines to bless the preaching of his word in a special way. Listen to Ian Murray. In the 19th century, a school of thought developed that believed revivals could be permanent if only the churches were faithful and used the right methods. The argument was that just as one individual is converted by accepting Christ, why cannot numbers be induced to accept them at the same time? According to this thinking, revivals occur in proportion to human effort. The mistake was to ignore that regeneration is the true cause of conversion, and it is not within the ability of speaker or hearer to determine when anyone passes from death to life. The church is to preach Christ, but he determines the increase. As William Lockhart says, a revival can't be got up, it must be got down. We need to keep preaching. We need to keep praying. And we just need to keep trusting. If God could do that in Nineveh, he could do it anywhere. And let me tell you, if, if God could do that through Jonah, a flawed prophet like Jonah, he could do it through a flawed preacher, a flawed pastor like yourself. 
This is what God delights to do. So may we continue to pray that God would stir each of us to go where he commands, to preach his word, so that we can have the great joy and the great honor of just watching him work to his own praise and his own glory. Amen. Amen. Let me pray for us. And Father, that is our prayer, and that is our hope, that each one of us will be faithful to go. That's the first and most foundational thing. We need to go to the lost. When we get there, please free us up from any fear that would keep us from preaching the word of God. That's the one thing you've promised to bless. It's the one thing that brings hope. It's the one thing that could save a soul. So let us go and let us preach and then give us the great joy and the great honor of seeing you work. And as you work, let us return all praise and all glory to you. In Christ's name, amen.